Well, thanks, Sabinia. As, as we heard from Sabinia there, the, probably the best way of inspiring young people into space is human space flight. And uh, so we're going to discuss the role of resources in the human exploration of space. Uh, Pete, you um, ran NASA Ames for many years. So um, the, I suppose the history of human space flight, of course, is using the resources on Earth and taking them all up into space. So how will the asteroids change that? Well, we're beginning the next phase of human exploration, which is actually human expansion into space. Uh, sometime in the next 10 or 15 years, the first permanent human, I'll call them settlements, off the Earth will occur, whether it's on the Moon or Mars or both, which is what I prefer. Uh, we're going to have to use resources that we find there. Asteroids present the best opportunity for fuel. The material the, to take us between planets. Uh, it's going to be almost impossible to affordably settle and to plan our supplies for these uh, these settlements uh, without using resources. And asteroids will provide the fuel first, and then maybe the manufacturing uh, capabilities. Within a few decades, we may even have settlements that are not on the moon or Mars, but in space. So that all is going to require asteroid resources. And by fuel, you mean water, essentially, from the asteroids? E e exactly. Uh, uh, water is the ultimate fuel. Uh, you use sunlight to crack it into hydrogen and oxygen, which is, is rocket fuel. Uh, there's also other what are called volatiles, that are things like you know, kerosene and so forth. Those are all the fuel that will carry us between worlds. Ed, um, you, you have, of course, first-hand experience of living in space, an extended period. I mean, do, can you see this future? Is, is it close, the future where people will spend extended times in space using the resources in the asteroids and beyond, and really us becoming a multi-planetary species? I am sure it's going to happen. Uh, I look at the way things are currently as um, perhaps the way you know early humans were when they would venture out into the ocean, but you would stay near your little bay and you would go back home at night and, and uh, maybe take what you needed, you know, bring your lunch out there, go fishing and come back home. Um, but what's going to happen is an expansion, not just for exploration, but to, to go and, and spread out uh, as humans have spread throughout the world. Now, the next days is going to be us expanding throughout the solar system. That means uh, becoming not just visitors to the solar system, but inhabitants of the solar system. And that's going to mean using resources in space. It's going to mean visiting multiple bodies. It's going to be um, uh, both protecting from being hit by things as well as taking advantage of things that are out there. And so I think we're at that phase now where we were, where the early humans were when they first, you know, embarked out on the oceans on their great voyages. And that's the, that's the mapping phase, okay, where, where we're going to begin to find, track, and understand where all these objects are and where they're going so we know the locations of things. And eventually we will get to the point where we're out there living and, and, and working and, and, and uh, it'll become part of the human sphere, if you'd like. And Patrick, what, what is out there? Because I suppose when you say asteroid, if you said it just to, you know, free associates, people just say lumps of rock. Yeah, there are great di diversities of bodies. Basically, you have uh, silicate-rich bodies, you have carbon-rich bodies, you have uh, hydrated minerals, and therefore there are a lot of material, rare materials, by the way, uh, all the gold, the platinum, etc., come from asteroids, most of it in the core of the Earth, because these are what we call siderophile elements, which tend to uh, be friends with uh, the iron. So when the Earth was formed and the iron went into the, into the core of the Earth, then it took everything with it, all the siderophile elements. And so the rest, which is in the mantle, has been brought by asteroids. So we know that we have rare elements, we have hydrated minerals, etc. Now the next step is really to understand how to extract this material, like the water from the hydrated minerals, uh, how to uh, 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 let's say, cope with the surface of the asteroid in order to be able to use this material. And we are just beginning. So there will be uh, a few steps before we are able to do so. Thanks to these uh, missions, those Iris Rex, Ayabusa 2, uh, hopefully Ida, etc., we'll learn more and more how to interact. We are at the very beginning stage. But I think the Luxembourg Initiative is great because if you wait to do it when you need it, it's already too late because we need some steps in order to be able to control all these things. So it's good to be aware that, as Lou, Ed, Ed said, sorry, uh, eventually we'll have to do it, but let's start to learn to do it before we need it. And I think this is now that we, we need to start.
And, uh, uh, Fritz, uh, so you're from OHB, you're a commercial company. So um, it, are there business plans being developed now or are, are you in technology demonstrator mode or both? Um, yeah, we are not yet in business plans, but uh, we are looking into what are the ingredients, what is required to establish solid business plans. That means what technologies to work on, where to go. So in particular, uh, what would be the next steps? Because as you said, uh, if it's required tomorrow, it's too late. Uh, we cannot do it uh, within a day. So for us, it is really a medium long term perspective to be in time time with the right technology there in order then to do also commercial business, potential institutional business. Um, it likely it's a mixture of all of this and uh, that's where we prepare us for. And that's also why we are here today, why we think uh, this event, uh, this asteroid day is of such importance and in particular the discussions, the very valuable discussions are so important. No, no, Klaus, you're head of life sciences. Yes. So, so um, how, how does how does a life sciences? What, what does that what does that mean? What what component of this exploration is life sciences? Yeah. First, let me explain that um, life is impossible without resources, and shaped resources are impossible without life, because life is creating a lot of resources. We are daily using oil. It's from organic matter. So that clearly belongs to, to each other and uh, so we have to bring together life scientists, ecologists and whatever in that uh, initiative to demonstrate that biological particles or let's say life forms can use resources, asteroid resources. We have to find uh, carbon, nitrogen, force with the basic molecules we need if you, have, if you want to have explorers living somewhere, if they go to, a, to an outer body without carbon, it will be hard that they can withstand there because they have no carbon source. On the other side, we see on Earth that we have a lot of biological organisms living in very extreme situations, using ex under extreme circumstances resources. So we have to bring this together and that's what we are trying now also in the initiative here in Luxembourg not as the head of life science of OHB, but uh, as the chief scientist of Blue Horizon, to bring this together here and create new tools to give explorers with them what is maybe not just technosphere, what is more a biosphere, what they can take with them. I think we have um, a tweet that's just coming actually, which is a comment. So let's see, see what that is. Yes, we've had a, we've had a tweet. Um, it's not a question. Um, it's. Uh, Something for us to look at over here, where we've been working very hard, and it seems as if those over in the Science Centre have just been having a lot of fun. Um, so, yes, this is a, a tweet from, um, from astronaut Nicole Stott, um, who's doing um, what looks like an impression of walking on air. Or, so, yeah, so that's what's happening over in the Science Centre um, while we're getting on with all the serious stuff over here. Having a good time out there. Um, in terms of, you've characterised it, well, actually, we're not just talking about going to the asteroids, getting raw materials and bringing them back for construction on Earth. Um, we're talking about expanding humanity's reach and living out in space. Um, is, that a, is that a short to medium term goal? We, we, we could do it now, presumably, if we wanted. Well, I think the... the, the you know, there's an argument about how, how long-term it is, but uh, there are private individuals like Elon Musk uh, who have talked about settling Mars, and he intends to begin within a decade. So I think it's much closer than we think. Uh, there are others, uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon has talked about settling the moon, and is even now setting up an organization to do that. I believe, and I think there's good evidence to believe, that the private sector will begin the settlement of space uh, by the end of next decade. Yeah, you're you're both yeah. uh, agreeing. Yeah, I agree, but um, because we have to really think about the next steps very, very immediately. Because, uh, as you said, Elon Musk and there they are all starting up the the, the engines to go, and uh, we have to fill a lot of gaps uh, in that in that road map, and uh, also from the commercial point of view, what you said before. 
for example, when you extract oxygen out of uh, metal oxides or whatever, you can do it by physical, physical chemical processes, or you can look for simple bacteria, they do it for you. So yeah, we have to develop the technology and then we can also we have the commercial aspect. I think there is also something which is that now we start to have cooperation between private yeah. funding and public funding. I think this is essential because this uh, business will need to take some risks initially because we know, as I said, uh, uh, how to interact with an asteroid, etc. So if we don't want to take a risk, that becomes a science mission. You want to be sure and therefore you cannot do much. You need to take yeah. more risk because maybe the first time you will fail and that has to be acceptable. Yeah. And to, yeah. to be acceptable, you need to have two sources of fundings where at least one source could say, okay, this is my risk, I accept it. Otherwise, uh, it will take too much time. So the way to, inc yeah. to increase the, the, the rapidity of the process is really this uh, combination, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, programs with taxpayers' money have to be 100% exactly. proof, sure and uh, safe. And there, not to risk human life, but to risk in uh, the way how the technology is assessed, how to go there, to do a step earlier than waiting till everything is uh, double and triple and quadruple checked uh, at the end. So this is a very important point, I think. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And asteroids provide here an excellent tool because they have one advantage. They are celestial bodies which come to us also. So we have to find the ways to use them. We have not to go to the uh, asteroid belt to grab them rather than we have to find ways within technology to detect them, to find them, to categorize them, to use them, and some of them may be hostile to prevent our Earth then from it. So it's a complex task, but uh, also it offers really a very valuable resource, asteroids. Some, uh, I heard once that wording, so asteroids are the low-hanging fruits of the universe. Do, do you think, um, Ed, that we, we um, Pete mentioned the Moon and Mars, and I suppose that's what people think of first when they think of human exploration beyond the Moon and Moon bases. Uh, where do the asteroids fit in the human colonization of space? Well, like Pete mentioned, I think they're, they're great sources of the things you need in space, which is building materials and fuel. And uh, they are the easiest place to, to get them in the sense of uh, you don't have to drop down into a, what's called a planetary well where you, you drop and then have to lift it back up. So, uh, in, and the last thing they are is, as you, as you mentioned, they come close to Earth. So they are sort of relatively easy to reach from a, a dynamic standpoint because you, you do have to match speeds with something in order to uh, stop that. You don't want to whiz past it. Uh, at uh, you know, 100,000 kilometers an hour doesn't do you any good. You need to stop. And uh, a lot of them, in fact, the ones that are actually most dangerous to the Earth are the ones that come close at relatively slow velocities because they tend to get sucked in towards the Earth. And uh, so those ones, which do happen on occasion, uh, are actually relatively easy targets, as you mentioned, low-hanging fruit. However, I would say that uh, we have the opposite problem than on a planet where you need to fight the gravity. The fact that there is low gravity, and I think this is really a serious problem, I mean, fascinating for the scientists, but serious for resources, is the fact that uh, even though even though the physical laws are the same, of course, as on Earth, the way they express in low gravity is not uh, intuitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we find, and I'm doing modeling of granular material in low gravity, uh, some expression which are very different than what we expect. So in order to be able to design a, 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 an efficient tool to extract material, unless you can do experiments in low gravity to see how the material reacts, but assuming you already know the material properties, you need a lot of effort in modeling. So we, fortunately, because of all these science missions, we have a science community which have a lot of expertise uh, in this field, because this is pure physics, by the way, uh, and uh, we are ready to support these initiatives, but it will be very important because there are things you cannot uh, really int intuit because we are based on our experience on Earth. I should say that they're not intuitive to someone who's lived on the ground their whole of entire course. life. Uh, I <laughs> and, don't have your luck and, I don't, uh, and your courage. I, I, I used to always be amazed by, I, I, one of the things I kept on, t on the space station with me is that I had a bag of bolts. And it was a big plastic bag, and we had to remove a bunch of what were called launch locks. There are just the bolts that hold everything in place 
for launch where things are shaking around, and uh, but they're not needed once you get into space. So we just remove them. Most of the panels and things like that are not held in by any bolts mm -hmm. on the interior so that you could open things up easily. So one of our first jobs uh, on my second flight was to remove thousands of these bolts. And I kept them in a big bag. And, and they all floated around in there. So mm -hmm. sort of like uh, you know rock particles on the surface of a, and they just moved around slowly. But if you pulled on the bag, and this is a clear plastic bag, and just pulled on it, provided a little bit of acceleration, they all settled to the bottom into some sort of, like a liquid at the bottom, and they would hold at the bottom. So that as long as you were accelerating, so if you spun, they, they, would, they would hold into position, and you could actually put your hand inside there and, and pull one out. But then you could spin yourself a little more slowly, and then they would start to bounce around to the point where if you slowed down enough and you touched the side of the bag, they would, it would almost look like an explosion, and they would start to move around. <laughs> and this is the type of behavior you, know, you will get around. You should go again, and we bring experiment. <laughs> I, I think, I think <laughs> you know, the ISS is the best place for it because the problem in low gravity is that the uh, uh, behavior is, takes a time scale which is much longer than on Earth. So if you use a parabolic flight, which is already something, it's 20 seconds. And sometimes the time, like to make a, uh, provoke a landslide, mm -hmm. takes more time than the 20 yeah. seconds. In the ISS, you have a lot of time. You have clever astronauts that can bring our stuff. <laughs> Too bad I didn't meet you before you went because uh, you would have carried a lot of material. Yeah, and I will find that video, and, it's, <laughs> and I even remember the title of the video, which was Bag of Bolts. <laughs> so it's on YouTube, is it somewhere? We can have a look at it. I don't think it, it isn't. It's just in my collection um, of stuff. Well, unfortunately, we've um, run out of time um, again. I just want, can I, if I've got 10 seconds, I just want to ask, in terms of NASA, because we see that the goal changes a lot. So you get the moon, then you get Mars, you get the asteroids, and it was the asteroids for a while. Is there a difficulty um, in that they're not as sexy, as it were, as, as going to Mars, even though they would probably, from a scientific and engineering standpoint, be the next step? I think one of the problems, having been involved at NASA, is that if one president says something, then the other party opposes it, and then a new president says something different. So what we're seeing is a change of politics. So if Obama wanted to go to asteroids, and maybe Trump wants to go to the moon, or maybe he wants to go to Mars. And, and so I think what we really need is, a, is more commitment. And this is where the private sector, as everybody said, mm -hmm. because they can hold all this together for a commitment, a long-term commitment, mm -hmm. that'll take us to the solar system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. We've completely yeah. run out of time now. However, insulation periods. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, this time I'm going to get it right because I've been told that I'm going to say over to Savinia. Thank you, Brian. You were right. And thank you also, gentlemen, for teaching us, the viewers, a new quote that asteroids are the low-hanging fruit of the universe. So with that, let's go on to Portugal, Asteroid Day in Portugal, and speak to Teres Monera CX. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> Welcome, happy Asteroid Day. Okay. Uh, welcome to South Foundation, where the Asteroid Day Portugal is taking place. And welcome also to our beautiful city of Porto. I'm Teresa Seixas, um, coordinator of AD Portugal. We are very excited to participate in these worldwide commemorations. Our local event is organized by the Faculty of Science, by the Institute of Astrophysics of the University of Porto, by the Center for Earth and Space Research of the University of Coimbra and by Selfs Foundation. Our program includes activities for children, a lecture for the general public, and an exposition of meteorites. I wish everyone a happy Asteroid Day 2017. Bye. Thank you very much, Therese, and thank you for your support and also sponsorship of or support of Asteroid Day. And with that, it's time to go back to our astrophysicist. Who am I talking about? Of course, John Luca. Thank you very much, Sabine, for uh, giving me this chance again to connect with another observatory. And now we move to China, and we are very happy to welcome here Dr. Haibin Zhao from Purple Mountain Observatory. So thank you for joining, and uh, good asteroid day, of course. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you, can you? I'm the asking of Purple Mountain Observatory of China. Thank you. For oh, I... I am in my dorm. Uh, it's a pity the weather here is not so good. So I, I'm just waiting for the clear sky. Yeah. 
So are you observing right now? I see, a, I see something like a telescope behind you, right? Yes, yes. This is our telescope. Yeah, our telescope is a Schmidt telescope with the uh, diameter is about uh, uh, 1.2 meter. And uh, the field of view of the telescope is, uh, is quite large. Uh, with a 10K by 10K CCD camera, it can cover 3 degree by 3 degree for one shot. So I see so, it, is, uh, it is just perfect for this kind of work. So you have a very nice telescope in your hands, I see. And uh, I would like to ask you if you are just observing something you would like to share with us, if possible. Yes. And actually, uh, our telescope is the only telescope to devote itself to search, actually, and then to search the physical uh, characteristics of the asteroid. For example, we carry out a program to uh, obtain a very, very large asteroid population for rotational characteristics and uh, statistics for the distribution of the asteroid material. I think it will uh, make, it, make me clear uh, how evolution of the asteroid belt and the asteroid family, and uh, even how evolution for the solar system. In fact, until now, a human uh, cannot understand how the solar system is running. Yes. Yes, I am. And another point for us to find is to find the near-Earth object. So, actually, the human so and the Earth been, is I've always... Been. Yeah? No, 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 uh, please continue, please, thank you. Continue, okay. The human and the Earth is always under the danger caused by asteroids. In 2013, the Terry Meteorology yes. is a yes, good example. Very difficult. <laughs> yeah, our telescope is the last field of view uh, telescope, and it is very suitable to observe. We have found more than 10 year of near Earth objects and always monitor dozens of NEOs every night and uh, update their orbit combination. So I see that you are really, really a big potential there. And I think you are, you are doing really a leading job for asteroid, near-Earth asteroid there in China. So for us, it was a very special, special, um, I mean, uh, special value for us to meet you and to hear from you what you are doing there. So thank you very much for joining this edition of Asteroid Day. I understand you are in the middle of the night, so I think you will be observing for a while before going to sleep, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so everyone, everyone here is wishing you a great asteroid day. I would say even a great asteroid night at this point. So thank you very, very much. And we are back to the studio here and again with Sabine. Thank you, John Luca. And with that, we fly over to the Science Center, where I think Natalie is with potentially two astronauts in the kitchen lab. So Natalie, what's cooking over there? Nothing is cooking yet. Uh, we are about uh, to start, so we are here in the in the kitchen lab. And next to me is Nadia Batello. She is a biologist, and uh, she's also a scientific a science mediator. With her is Susan McKean, Kina, who is an Irish McKenna, an Irish astrophysicist. And next to me is uh, Jean-François Clairvaux, a French engineer, and is an astronaut. And what have you planned for them and for you to do? So Natalie, believe it or not, in about four minutes' time, there's going to be a huge asteroid impact happening here in the Luxembourg Science Center's kitchen lab. So these two guys, I thought they would be really well trained to help me to build, to construct, to form the asteroids, OK? So show us. So Go ahead. Here's the asteroid mass. It's basically chocolate. And everybody just takes a bit of chocolate puts it in between the fingers and starts rolling, okay? So asteroids usually are not round, they are potato-shaped, so we try to get to reality as, 
as much as possible. You have, have you done your asteroids? Yes, exactly, but like a potato, oh, perfect. This one is look, looks awesome. And then you just put them in whatever dipping you have here. So whatever you feel like to. You take one, you take two, you take three. Jean-François, you spent uh, 675 hours in space. Uh, did you eat chocolate oh, yes. up there? Chocolate from Belgium, from France, from Houston, and from Switzerland. The day of Christmas, because um, we had on board Claude Nicolier from Switzerland, and he brought the best chocolate ever. So what should they do now? So now the asteroids are perfect. Maybe you can still dip a bit inside here. And then we need to take those, and just in front here, there is the moon, and we will, on the moon, create a huge crater. So maybe you can join me. And you can just stand over, normally it should be working well. And then you dump your asteroid, you dump it onto the moon, okay? Let me show that. Oh, wow. Wow. And we see some great uh, craters over there. So how are they formed? Exactly. So this is craters, how they also would look on the moon. There are some differences, but the crater actually happens on the impact. And during the impact, there's energy transferred and there's a big shockwave forming, which basically makes that the material, it's not only condensed, but also ejected. So this is what you see here. Basically, there's some material from the inside of the moon ejected outside. Do you think we can find chocolate on the moon? No. <laughs> no, it's a bit, but maybe you can tell me. I, I never was there. I never was in space, so I cannot tell you. <laughs> Were you ever afraid of uh, meeting an asteroid? It's a concern because the main risk we have once we are on orbit is impact of small asteroids. I mean, big also, but the probability, since we are small, we have more probability to capture smaller asteroids than big ones. And it's such one chance over 300, typically, to lose the ship or the crew because of an impact. So it's a concern. We, we have shield around habitats on the space station on purpose to protect for that. And at what size do they become dangerous here on Earth? On, on Earth, I think, uh, typically, a uh, few hundred meter wide rock coming into the atmosphere would be a, a, a big disaster for humankind and all form of life on Earth. But I think uh, these asteroids here, these chocolate asteroids, I think we should really try them because they, exactly. they are delicious. So maybe you just... something. Yeah. Yes. I didn't make an asteroid, I made a comet. And the first uh, nucleus of a comet that was ever seen, we knew that it was peanut shaped. Yeah. So what's gone in there is peanut shaped. And I used one of those white things to show light that was reflected from a high point on Halley's Comet. So this has now gone into the chocolate and all is hidden, so I'm revealing what's there. It's beautiful. <laughs> and we just say from here, bon appétit. You bon appétit. Thank you very much, Natalie. And what a perfect way to illustrate when we talk about the importance of educating our children by making a chocolate cake that resembles the moon. And with that, I'd like to give a warm welcome to my new guest, who is Jochen Harms, who is Managing Director of OHB Venture Capital. Um, I want to, it's a question I've been asking nearly everyone, but it is also about Astro Day today. So I just want to see why is it important for you and your company to support and sponsor Astro Day and what you hope that we can contribute with? Well, we are sponsoring Astro Day as part of OHB Group, um, and we are already invested in this type of activities with our companies Astrofactum um, and Blue Horizon. So working that further out in other companies is an important issue for us. Mm. And as you're in the venture capital sector, what's your main focus of investment today? We're talking a lot about startups within space and sort of space technology. Well, the focus is always people and ideas. Mm. And we are people and ideas in space. Mm -hmm. And there are not so many ideas, um, not so many really new ideas. And we try to find, pick the raisins Less from a commercial perspective, from a capital perspective, but from things that are breakthrough mm. ideas. Mm. 
And I was also thinking, um, bearing in mind that this is the third year of Asteroid Day, how do you think that the involvement of Asteroid Day has gone so far with having an impact? I think it must have an impact because mm. this is, the reality is that this is the only real issue for mankind mm. in space. If a telecom satellite dies, it dies. Mm. But if an asteroid hits Earth, it's finished. Mm. Well, on that note, I will leave it over to Brian, who now has a very renowned and eminent panel and a really interesting topic. Brian, 